been doing in recent what um what I've been doing in recent years. And I will start with um, just give you a basic presentation about what I've been doing. I can't show you all the work from my new book because it's not published yet, but it will come out very soon. Um, on that note, I intentionally leave a bit this first slide. There's some information of the different blogs I'm running, um, particularly the new one, which may interest you because I talk about it at the end of this uh, presentation. Also, I'm posting regularly on Instagram, and that means you are more than welcome to see my work there. Um, mostly it's plants, I, I document plants, and I document hand drawings over the last 30 years. I think this first slide already gets me right into the uh, mode of the discussion today. As you can see here on the right, this is from uh, my sketchbook. So when I do develop ideas, I always hand draw. I visualize everything I do just for myself. This is like people write text, I draw. And this is the first, um, I scanned this for you, uh, photographed it and then made it legible for you. Uh, a little sketch I did last, as you can see in May this year, and before I spoke to one of two of my graduate students to develop this AXO blog with me. And I thought I'd just show you how I start thinking, you know, about how the blog would be layout, what the content is, and immediately working with all the different tools um, to think about landscape architecture, to think about um, spatial thinking, etc. And you can already see here how I use annotation and to um, document my thoughts so that I won't forget what I want to say later on and so on. So it gives you a good sense where we are going in this lecture today. Um, now I have to just check why this is not um, this is not moving forward. So that's not good. Um, well, there we are. Let's see. Now I was just stuck there a bit. It's the computers. Um, but there we are. Um, here is um, the site immersion, the first slide I wanted to briefly talk about. When I, when I talk about designing, I firstly always talk about um, the process of a project. And this is one of the slides from my, my current book, and it's really important for you to know the basics first. So when we talk about design, for me, it has six phases, site immersion, recording, analysis, synthesis, ideation, and final design. Today, we will talk specifically, and this is my most biggest critique I have about site immersion and recording and analysis, particularly site immersion. Site immersion and recording is not taught enough in school. And by that, I mean, you have to go to the site multiple, multiple times to actually understand it well, to really engage with the site. I think it is really important to do that. So now it's definitely working. I just want to make sure. And what I, what I also wanted to show you, you can see on this very simple diagram how the design process is not linear going down. You always recheck, re-question. And one of my biggest concern of um, designing is that we are not checking enough on site. Give you a good example, La Palma, the current volcano, um, which has erupted. How can it be that 1,200 houses are destroyed because in the, they are site, you know, obviously positioned in the lava stream? With the technology we have today, with the topographical maps, this should have never happened. They shouldn't have built since the last 50 years those houses into that, of course, historic houses, sure, but new houses should not have been built into that area. So I think that's a really important point to address that you really think about that carefully when you make decisions. So that I think is one of the major issues I would like to address today. And that's a visual sense you have to use. You have to understand the topography and then make the decision we are not building houses into the lava stream. But there are four other senses we are always forgetting. So for me, and this is a sketch from my book, um, site immersion in landscape is multisensorial. You never see the site just by sight. You touch it, you taste it, you hear it, 
and you smell it. And I think to visualize that is very difficult. And I spent the last seven years starting doing this and we are just at the beginning, but I think it's just something you, you may want to um, think of in the future that that's something I think which is very important <clears throat> to consider when you design. So there's also this discussion, why always site is prioritized over the others? There's no reason to, because a lot of the things you taste better or you feel better before you see them. Or if a person is visually or hearing impaired, they, their other senses take over and have an amazing ability to really experience the environment. Now, there has been a lot of research recently um, in, the, uh, up, uh, in this field, um, but I think the biggest problem is the research is mostly separated. There's no textbook on this. So I've written and compiled all the research over the recent years, and that is one of the major issues I think we need to address. So the first big issue is site immersion is key to do good designs at any scale, at the garden scale, at the, the park scale, or at the regional scale, but at the multisensorial, understanding of multisensorially, rigorously. And um, I think this, I call it even like a doctor diagnostics because you really need to understand it well. And I think that's one of the major issues of the field that we do not do this deeply enough. Now, I think this is important also from my book. How do you record and visualize the senses? How do you do it? So you have tools. You have visual notes, as you can see at the top, photos, videos, mapping, aerial maps, drone imagery text. So what I did here on this slide, it's recorded, so you don't have to take it down. But what I did on this slide, I went through all the five senses and I decided what tools are available and what you can actually visualize with them. So what is possible, what you can do, actually, how you can visualize. And so I think that's an important tool for you to use and experiment yourself. We all have different ways how we, we see the world. So that's really up to you as the designer how to use them. But I thought I categorized them. And this is uh, my categorization I produced for my book. And I think it's an important point um, because it will help you to make decisions which tool to use. Now, in recent, recent research has been, there's been a lot on virtual realities. Lumion, they are now, they can make sound effects. And, you know, the, the digital world is amazing, virtual reality. But it is still relying, currently at least, oh, we will see in the future, on sight and audio. It cannot simulate physical touch, smell, and taste of the sight. And I think that's one of the biggest issues. It still cannot do that. And um, they're working on it that you, you, know, you have virtual reality and you have a glove and you can feel something, but it's not the same as if you go in the environment and feel it and engaging with all the different senses. Also, the senses always work together. It's not just one sense. They are engaging together. And that brings me to the major part. There's two things we need to differentiate. First, I wrote it, and then I drew it. Observing. So that, for me, is the cognitive act of hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling, and seeing. And then there's perception. I come from Germany, which is called Wahrnehmung in German. Understanding the truth. And that is the synthesis, the memories, the emotions, and feeling experienced in tandem with these new sensorial experiences. So observing happens instantly. Perception can take time. I give you an example. You smell a strawberry in a garden, and then maybe a few minutes later, it reminds you of the wonderful pie your granny made with strawberries. It synthesizes. So perception is a reaction while the observation is happening instantly. And you as landscape architects need to be trained in this field deeply. 
much more than we do today. You should be going to site three, four times during your design phases to actually uh, work out the projects. I think that would really help the process immensely. So what does that mean in landscape, understanding the sensorial, lands, uh, the sensorial analysis of a landscape? So I categorized it, if you look very carefully here in two areas, the observation and the perception. And you can see we, there's the actual landscape. There it is, you're, you're viewing it, and then you have your tools. Obviously, you're not gonna eat the landscape, so it's only four. Obviously, there are five. You could, you could pick, but in this case, there are only four. If there was an apple tree and you could smell it, you could also taste it. I left that out for this one. But the interaction, what happens here, that's really important. So I, I use these icons to define the different senses. And later on in our workshop, we will, in the workshop part, we'll talk about this, how I use them, classify them. But then on the other hand, I use these other icons in the perception stage to show the different moods. So I define them like, for example, childhood memories, happy, adventurous, scared. It's an extensive. That's up to you how to make those decisions. But I just wanted you to understand there are two steps. The step one is the observation of the site. And then the step two is the perception. And the cognition between is the brain, where it all gets processed. You are not, we are not scientists and we don't need to know all that, the, those details, how it actually works. But you should understand these two different distinctions and how the senses and how important perception is when making design decisions because they are personal. You as a designer have complete control over your designs. And this is what this is trying to describe, depending on how well you observe the landscape. To make this easy, I always think not always drawing is maybe the biggest start. So for me, this is also an intellectual exercise. <clears throat> so partially in my book, I talk about this deeply <clears throat> in the sense that I look at different uh, fruits, for example, and start understanding them from the different senses, what that means to me. And then I give that words. So you can see here, strawberries, bananas, potato chips, and then a wooden chair. Just to give different objects or fruit or vegetable, just to define what that actually means to me. Writing that down in these kinds of categorizations will help you to understand <clears throat> what is important about the tool or the object or the fruit or whatever it is you try and to decide what the different experiences are of this tool. Now you could do the same <clears throat> with a site immersion analysis of a site. So here I have different gardens, a remedial garden, a vegetable garden, a medieval garden, and an arid ecosystem. And you can see by looking at those, again, the different senses, the different kinds of experience, and you can start categorizing those different um, emotions you have. That will help you to go much more deep in your design process. So you can make your own matrix and then start thinking really deeply when you're on site, you can sketch the site, you do that anyway, but this also helps you to experience the site and annotate and take notes. My most recent article, we have developed for students, this is in China, where to look at historic, Chinese gardens to experience the senses. This is in English and Chinese, so you can download this on my research gate free. You go on research gate, you can download it. But I want to show you a little bit of this project. So what we did here, <clears throat> we went, I developed a matrix with my research team. And with this matrix, we went through the garden and then we went through the garden to understand. So we looked at the sensorial experience, soundscape, smellscape, touchscape, et cetera, and uh, tastescape if you wanted, if it was a restaurant. And then we went in and then categorized the different experiences, the different things we experienced in this garden, different landscape elements, for example. And that 
really def defines how we then look at the different elements in the garden. So the different sensorial experiences, for example, the wind interaction with the plants, the rain interaction with the plants, then the smell, the musky smell of the plants when it rains and so on. So, and then we gave the different hierarchy, different categorization hierarchies to develop this. So what I wanted to show you with this is these kinds of systems explain deeply how you can categorize intellectually the different multisensorial senses. And then we went to different gardens, four different gardens, and walked through them. I've been to China, I had an office in China, and my Chinese research colleague, she went so we could do this. We had seen these, so we could actually document that and wrote down the different experiences in those gardens, what the different sounds were in the different pavilions. Of course, still separate, because it was complicated at the beginning for us to understand. But it was a start, we tried it. It was tough because I had to uh, get her to translate for me all the Chinese characters. So I understood actually the drawings. Um, but that was just to show you one way how we actually went through it. Then we looked at the obviously different photo images and so on. I'd been to all these gardens during my time in China, she's gone there regularly as a professor in China in landscape architecture. So we looked at this and then I had a former graduate student making sense maps of each sense and the different experiences. So that when the students from the landscape architecture department went to these gardens could go there focusing on the different senses. Of course, they all work together as you can see, there are different sense maps for hearing, touching, um, and then I think the final one, yeah, this is touching, hearing, and this first one is smelling, so that they start to consciously engage with the landscape. That was one thing I've really um, wanted to push with this, is that we need to teach the students, or you need to go yourself in these spaces, any garden, you can do it and start really understanding how the different gardens, how they work, how they interact. This is another garden, same thing. We went through the garden as the whole categorization list, different kinds of experiences. And then we, uh, I, this time I left out the red uh, translation so you can see how beautiful these um, uh, drawings are of these historic, this is the humble administrator garden in China, a very important Chinese garden. And um, I, same thing, we went through it again, and then went through the different senses. You could, of course, overlay all the three layers, but to make it easier for the observing, for the really consciously observing the senses, we separated the different layers, but you could layer them all together, but here's the same thing again. So this just shows you how important that is. Why is this important? Well, I've written another paper last year called Gardens Are Buildings, where I say, where I question the role of the garden in relation to landscape architecture. And in this paper, which is also freely available for you, I develop matrices looking at the different activities in the different gardens to define the architecture in relation to the garden activity. I give you an example. Here is the matrix. So for example, a private residency or a governmental building or a research lab, what kind of open space adjacent to it is important? For example, a governmental building, relaxation for the workers is important. As we have learned through COVID, outside space is valuable, extremely important. And in dense cities, not much outdoor space is available. So this hierarchical system helps to define what activities are needed in the outdoor spaces specific to the architectural typology of the building. And that's really important to know. And then <clears throat> this is just also from, you know, just apart from that paper, but I think it's important to understand that. <clears throat> Why is this important? Because it goes together with the multisensorial experience, because if you do not understand the multisensorial experience, how can you design, for example, 
a relaxation space for the governmental workers <clears throat> or a hospital uh, for, in the hospital, a therapeutic gardens for the patients, the surgeons and the nurses and the family visiting the patients to develop gardens deeply who are helping these patients and the family to recover from that experience as we have seen with COVID, for example. And then here is a multisensorial checklist for the different, these are just some, for the different gardens where I'll categorize what is important, um, you know, what is important and what these activities in the outdoor spaces need to be. What is important, a lawn area, a planting bed, an atrium, what are the different parts you need in the garden because it's such a valuable space in cities. And these are some of the drawings we developed for those um, for this paper as well. You can see here on the left, my first conceptual drawings. And then I had a former graduate student, she's a landscape designer. She uh, redrew these wonderful drawings because I didn't have time. But I just wanted to show you how, again, how drawing is a language, how drawing is an ideation tool how drawing is helping you to really design deeply and how important that is when you design um, ideas in landscape architecture. And I think it's also important to see in these drawings, we were trying to think from site first and then think about the architecture. So first the garden, first the, in the block of a city, the open space, and then the architecture. I'm currently teaching a building where I'm asking the students to do just that. We are not the shrubber uppers at the end. We should be first on a site because we understand the context of the site and the surrounding context. That's the strength we have as landscape architects. And that brings me to the cube method, which we will use uh, in the workshop after um, to do, for you to see the existing site and it can then help you. And I will show you this in my <clears throat> workshop part. And then it can it help you to take, first of all, to see the site multisensorially at the different layers. Uh, and then you can also use this tool to design, um, to check your design in the surrounding context. There is no landscape architecture which doesn't look at the surrounding context. And that is, that's why I mentioned the very big example of the La Palma volcano, because if the city planners and the planners overall would have thought about this, maybe some of the houses would not have been built there. Same in mudflat areas, same in arid zones and so on. We've seen so many recent issues or fire, forest fire zones, et cetera. So it is our responsibility as landscape architects to take this on and really multisensorially understand the landscape. So this is the development of the cube method on my axometric blog, which I put the link at the beginning. You can go on that and learn how to do it. I show you some of the finalized drawings. This is just the first thinking, um, developing tools. And last year when I did the workshop and came in to teach at Guelph, I was developing this and I was I just have a paper currently under peer review for this as well, but I was developing this and it's gone further. I made it into a blog, which your students, you as students can use into, from everywhere in the world, but it was really inspired um, by the lecture I gave uh, in Guelph in spring. Uh, this year. And this is just to show you the cube method, how it is developed, and we do this together. And the size of the cube, the smaller the size, the more you can show the surrounding context, as you can see here in my drawing. And the cube method is a basic axonometric, but you look at the different layers. You look at the atmosphere, where the birds are, you look at the topography, and you look below at the soil profile. So you're looking at all the different levels and that helps you to design much more rigorously. And then you can implant your site plan, tilt it into the axonometric and make sure it fits with the surrounding area. So these are some of the development sketches for this. And I thought I'd show you them. And there you can see here already, this is the block diagram. Ian McCarg used those 
in the 60s and 70s a lot in his, uh, in his studios when he taught the students. And I took that inspiration from his wonderful block diagrams and expanded it and started extending it to the surrounding research. So if this is your site with your river and your topo, you should be looking at all the surrounding areas. You can do that all on your iPad or any kind of drawing. And these are some of the ref more refined drawings on the blog. And you can see here, you have all the levels in it and it is at scale. A, a, two, a one and two point perspective is always distorted because in the back, the people are smaller. While this, if you look carefully, the people in the back are the same scale as in the front. So for learning to see the world, this is a fantastic tool to actually understand multisensorially what's happening in the landscape and you can use it. And there you can see that the, this is the site and then you can play with it and build a garden in it and then see, for example, the shadow of the trees. Would that disturb the surrounding road? Would it disturb the neighbor's garden? So as a landscape architect, you must work in context. You must work with the surrounding areas. I think that's crucial in understanding. Otherwise, if you do not, um, you are, your work is not as rigorous in the sense it is not deeply explaining um, the problem. It, you are working just on site and that what that does is it doesn't make the project rigorous enough in testing it. And the axonometric is such a good tool to use in this instance. So I highly recommend this. So I made a little summary um, about what I think is important and what I was gonna try just to recap for you to say. So visualizing multisensory site perception, we are still designing too much focused on site. But site diagnostics needs all the five senses. What is the remedy? Most important is to understand the surrounding context. You need to think multisensorially. And we do that in my little uh, workshop in a minute. You have to not just look at sight what you see with the eyes. You must taste. Sound is important. Touch and smell. Why, for example, I'll give you a good other example. Sound of the bird species above your site can tell you about the ecological balance or imbalance of the site if you're a specialist. If you're not, you could get a specialist if it's an important project to make sure that the site is really rigorously researched. So with all these tools we have available today, you as landscape architect not, are not required to know everything, but you should be the overarching leader to then hire those people if it's not your field. That makes, we are like the GPs. So we like a general practitioner and to be able to diagnostic everything. And then that's why the GP is so important in medicine. They should be the best doctors because they have need to have the overall understanding. That's what a landscape architect should do. Should be overall understanding the environment and then make decisions if he needs a specialist and take on that leadership role. And that comes from that multisensorial experience. Um, another good example is you can smell the soil type. Is it, um, you know, the, is it sandy? It, has it PT? Is it loamy? You can smell it, touch it and smell it. You can analyze really quickly. You can smell climate change, you, the dryness in the forests. You can smell the danger of fire and the humidity, the opposite, maybe a flood. So this is our job to do that. We need to get much, much better in understanding that. Uh, and so I think that is one of the major parts. And then, and like I said, you need to spend much more time on site at the different six stages of the design and recheck, first of all, what you have analyzed, then your design proposals, if they actually fit the site, multisensorially, of course, but also technically. Is the site gonna be flooded in the future? That's our job now. We have all the technology. LIDAR 
you can use LIDAR, Bavaria, where I'm coming from originally, you can go online freely, plug in LIDAR, it tells you all where all the historic Roman forts are even, but it can also, you can program it and say, um, I want to know all the depressions, water bodies, where no water runs in and no water runs out. You can do that computer, uh, you know, give that task and it will tell you all the water bodies which have still lake, which are still lakes with very little run in and run out. Or you can say, I want all the water bodies where a river runs in and a river runs out. So we have that technology available. You don't need to know all that, but what you do need to know that it is available. And that makes a good leader. And that's what a landscape architect is. The next uh, pr project I'm doing is I'm going to develop a checklist for that. So maybe next year I'm further with this. The other thing, and that's what we will decide, talk about in the workshop, is if you think multisensorially, it will raise questions. For example, if you are designing a garden for a visually impaired person, what maybe the beauty, the color of the plants is not as important as the texture of the plants. Maybe the footpath towards that, the entrance area, the paving should be gravel so he can feel, or she or he, she or he can feel when he's going to that garden. Maybe the smell of the plants is more important. So you need to prioritize and think about this. When you, or you design, and that's what my book is about, giving you uh, ideas how to go about this. So you, you need to make yourself kind of lists and ask yourself intellectually the question, what is needed to satisfy the users? In this case, um, if, if sight is maybe not the priority, maybe sound and smell and touch suddenly overrules if the person is visually impaired or, or hearing, maybe the person can't hear. So, it may need other aspects which are important. So I think that is something I would like you to think of when you um, design um, multisensorially. And here are uh, some information on the, uh, the research gate where you can find the link to 